Historians look at political repression. They often do so during moments when political freedom is under attack. Thus, for example, the still definitive book on the Alien and Sedition Acts, James Morton Smith's Freedom's Fetters, was written at the height of the McCarthy era, as was Robert K. Murray's still valuable study of the 1919-1920 Red Scare. And it is, as they say, no accident that today's panel was organized at a time when the current administration was widely seen as trampling on people's rights, both here and abroad. That presentism is not necessarily a sin, but I would argue that the relative paucity of work in the field should not, I repeat, should not, be taken as an indication of the absence of political oppression in American society. And if we have a very broad definition of political repression, then we will see quite a bit of it. Historians, by the way, are not the only culprits. Political scientists, it turned out, do not pay much attention to political repression either. When I was working on my book, McCarthyism, the book that, um, about uh, McCarthyism that turned into many other crimes, I had assumed that there was going to be a lot of literature out there in other fields that I could uh, use to draw some theoretical uh, structure for the book. But I was wrong. Um, there was actually only one book that was particularly useful and it had been published in 1961. And that is the main reason why I'm currently collaborating with a political theorist since my sense is that a purely empirical treatment of American political repression risks simply producing a kind of list of one bad thing after another bad thing after another bad thing. And I'd like to have a little more, uh, what should we say, theoretical uh, sophistication here. Now, it is possible that one reason why historians and political scientists have devoted so little attention to the repressive side of American history is that they've operated under the all too common assumption that the moments when public and private authorities crack down on threats to the status quo are aberrations and that the American people's underlying devotion to freedom is so strong that whatever excesses occur during periods of stress, little long-term harm results. Since it turns out that such excesses, quote, seem to occur during just about every crisis in our nation's history, I do not think they are aberrations, but rather part of the normal functioning of the American political and social system. Political repression, in other words, is, is, is as American as apple pie. As a nation, it seems we are always having to say we're sorry. For that reason, it is not all that useful to conceptualize that repression, as most legal scholars have certainly done, in terms of assessing the balance between freedom and order or freedom and national security. I think that may come from the way in which lawyers look at the world anyhow in terms of antagonistic forces. But such an approach, I think, reifies the supposedly anomalous nature of American political <coughs> repression, turns it into a transitory phenomenon, and overlooks its historic function in shoring up the power of the nation's political, economic, and racial elites. Forgive me for stating the obvious here. But unless we look at the underlying patterns of repression, at the ways in which the suppression of dissent actually operate in this country, we're going to be caught up in a kind of intellectual Mobius strip of examining a recurring sequence of crackdowns and apologies. Now, one thing that I hope will emerge from treating political repression as an ordinary part of American politics is an understanding of what constitutes the uniquely American aspects of that repression. How, in other words, does the American style of political repression differ from that of other nations, if at all? One difference that is strikingly obvious 
is that in most other societies, political repression is a function of the state. In the United States, the responsibility for eliminating challenges to the political, economic, or racial status quo is shared between the private and the public sector. I listed college teachers, movie stars, and ordinary citizens during the McCarthy era reveal informal economic sanctions applied by private employers can be just as effective as official state action in squelching dissent. And in fact, there were many moments in the American past when the private sector handled most of the work. In the late 19th century, for example, more men worked for the Pinkerton Detective Agency than served in the United States Army. The notion, particularly popular, I think, about 15 years ago, that the institutions of civil society serve as a buffer against state-sponsored repression is, I think, simply inapplicable in the American context. Nor to take another um, uh, sort of myth about repression, if you were, if you wish, uh, nor does the federal structure of the American polity protect people's rights. Uh, those checks and balances and uh, the uh, diffusion of power between the national government and the local governments, in many cases merely amplify the repression by letting additional players get into the action. American political repression, then, is a collaborative venture, one in which every branch of government at every level and all the major institutions of civil society team up to defend the status quo. Not only does its collaborative nature make that repression effective, but, and I think this is very important, it also diffuses responsibility uh, for what goes on. And it thus contributes to the notion that political repression is somehow a minor factor in our nation's history. Another characteristic of political repression, and one that has become increasingly prominent over the years and is certainly uh, at the center of what's happening today, is that it is almost always accompanied by the invocation of national security. An over-solicitousness about individual rights should not, it is asserted, stand in the way of protecting the United States against its internal and external enemies. The Constitution, in the immortal words of Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, is not a suicide pact. 